All right, good morning. morning. Everybody ready today? Ready to go? Fired up, excited, right? Okay, well, at least two of you are fired up and excited. Anyway, we're going to continue talking about, we've been doing this series on core values, haven't we? We've been talking about the core values of our church. Today we are going to talk about fellowship. Now, I have to tell you that the last few weeks we've been talking about a number of things uh, with this same type of theme. Uh, Last week we talked about hospitality. Again, we're talking about fellowship today. I I view hospitality and fellowship as going kind of hand in hand. They really are the same thing in some ways, or or at least, you know, uh, the same, uh, different sides of the same coin. But it's really talking about opening ourselves up. We, t- we talk about hospitality and fellowship, and we think of maybe having a meal together or, or having a conversation with people. Uh, but it really what it comes down to, I believe, Christian fellowship and Christian hospitality, it- it's opening up our lives. It's understanding that we have a common ground that we are on, that our, our devotion to Jesus Christ and that therefore we are having a conversation with that as the foundation. And so we open up our lives to other people and we get to know each other better and our uh, love and respect for each other grows from that. And that's really what we're talking about with fellowship and hospitality. And so I wanna talk about that today. We're gonna use scripture, we're gonna use the book of Acts. We're gonna use Acts chapter two. And a couple things about Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 to 47, I think, is what we're going to do specifically. But let's historically look at a couple of background facts so that we understand what was going on. First is this. The important fact is our, uh, the part of chapter 2 that we're going to deal with today occurs after Pentecost. It occurs after the Holy Spirit has come. That's important because, frankly, we're still in the same age in the church today as they were at that moment. The Holy Spirit has come. We know what that means. I hope if you've been listening at all, when I speak, I always talk about this, the idea that when we submit ourselves to Christ, when we give our lives over to Christ, literally the Holy Spirit, the God, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us so that God, the Holy Spirit, is with us at all times. So so that has occurred at this point in time. Second, this is the birth of the church, shall we say. This is after Jesus has lived, he's died, he's resurrected, and now he's gone back to heaven. And now the disciples, the apostles are there to begin spreading the word of Jesus Christ. And this is really the first church. And what we're going to see in scripture today is really the blueprint for the first church. And we know God blesses the first church because it continues to grow and it has grown into what it is today. I'm sure much more than Peter could have ever envisioned in those days as one of the apostles the church has grown into. So we know God has blessed it and this is really the birth of that church. And I wanna talk a little bit about that, getting back to the roots of our birth, uh, the way the church was born and the way God wanted us to uh, be. Last but not least, and this is important because I'll bring this up at a later point in time, but it's important for you to remember that the church was being persecuted at this time. And it was being persecuted from several different angles. When you think about it, here is the church, uh, the, the young, just born Christian church, and the Jewish leaders were certainly not happy with the fact that the Christian church existed at that time. They were breaking away from those traditional uh, Jewish uh, uh, rules and regulations and and, and becoming this new church. So the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, all those people were clearly against the church and trying to persecute the church. The government, the Roman government at the time, clearly was against the church. We know that already. And and they were against, frankly, any group that was growing in size because it was a potential political enemy to them. And so they were being persecuted from several different sides. And when we talk about persecuted, it's not just people talking badly about them. There were people being killed for their beliefs. There were people, their very lives were endangered. So I want you to understand that as we go through this, that this was a time of persecution in the church. 
So normally what I do, I know, is we kind of take each little uh, section of Scripture by itself and talk about it. And I know you love it when I do that, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to disappoint you. I'm sure I, I look at all the disappointment on your faces. But it's, I'm going to literally read the whole thing. I want to read all verses 42 to 47 all at once because I want us to get a kind of overall picture of the Scripture. We'll talk about it a little overall, but then I have a couple specific verses we'll talk about after that. So let's look at the Scripture here, Acts 2, 42 to 47. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so there's our whole scripture and what it's really talking about. I hope you get the idea of why this is about fellowship because it's really about the fellowship of believers. It's about people coming together with a common purpose. Their love and devotion of Jesus Christ, their, their, their uh, uh, desire to learn more about Christ, their desire to be together, to care for one another, to break bread together, to learn about Christ together. That's really what we're talking about here, the fellowship of believers. And that's what our scripture is really in its grandest scheme all about. Now, I do want to tell you, I want to warn you on one thing. If you go afterwards and you want to look at this scripture on your own, and let's say you just go and Google it somewhere, I want to warn you about one thing. I don't want to waste a whole lot of time on this, but it is a fair warning, just so you know. What is this scripture not about? People have used this scripture to say that God is endorsing socialism or communism even. People have said that. I, I wish that people didn't go into those things, but that's what they have said. Because look, they had everything in common, even though what they're really saying is they had their beliefs in common. They had what they desired, to, the way they desired to live out their lives in common. But they make that sound like God is endorsing this certain political viewpoint. And I'm here to tell you a couple things just real quick. Number one, I don't believe that God is endorsing or not endorsing any particular political viewpoint. I don't believe that at all. I think God is concerned about saving souls. I think God is concerned about growing his church because the church is the vehicle through which he saves souls. So I don't think God is saying anything about political systems when, in this scripture. The second thing is I don't think factually it matches up anyway. Just because people pool their money together to help those in need does not make them a socialist or communist society. Because if it did, we'd be considered that as well. Because it's what we do, isn't it? Instead of each of us individually giving money to the caring cupboard, for example, we give our money together. We pool it together so it has a greater impact. You get what I'm saying, and I don't want to dwell on this. I just, it's out there as a friendly warning to you just to be careful with this scripture. I've seen it misused a number of different times. Now, I've really got two points to make. And, I, and in a sense, I'll say I've got two issues to take up with today's church and the scripture you just read and this idea of fellowship in the church. And the first one is this. The first one I want to talk about is from the very last verse, and it talks about fellowship, and it talks about a closed or an open fellowship. Because I'll be honest with you, I don't think we have a lot to go over if we just want to talk about fellowship within the church. I think over the years, I think even right now, I think the church honestly does a very good job with fellowshipping within itself. I really do. 
I think that whether it be at the church level or whether it be at the uh, Sunday school class level or at the Bible study level or even a small group or, or several families getting together, I think we as a church, I think, and I mean we, this not only Gravel Hill, but the church as a whole, I think we do a very good job of fellowshipping, of opening up our lives to each other of developing relationships based on the foundation of Christ. And starting when we open up our lives, what, what happens? We start caring for each other and we start loving each other in that way that Scripture tells us we are to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think the church overall does a very good job with that. But I think what the church tends to do, if there is a mistake being made through the years, it's this idea of a closed fellowship versus an open fellowship. Because what we tend to do is say, we have a fellowship already. I like my fellowship. I like this group that I'm a part of. And when somebody from outside sees this group and sees that they are opening their lives to each other and they are caring for each other and there is something special going on there, that does something to people outside of the group. They want to become a part of it, don't they? And through the years, I think the church has not been as good as it could be at certain stages of its existence, including now, We've not been as good as we could be of saying, great, come on in. Because society has taught us to be distrustful of people who are not in our little core group. Maybe they're coming in to take advantage of it, us. Maybe they're coming in for the wrong purposes to hurt us. But I'm telling you that Scripture is not asking us to be judgmental in that way. And the fact of the matter is, if those people come in and they really do try to hurt us in our groups, there's other Scripture out there that says, Paul says, it's okay. You can throw them out at that point in time if they are come into your group and you're trying to hurt them. But God is telling us, I believe through this Scripture, that it's more important to bring them in than it is to be distrustful. And what he is saying is this. The last verse that we read today says this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What that says to me is that this early church was fellowshipping with each other. They were showing love for each other. People outside of the church said, that is something I want to be involved in. And they said, I want to go join. And God is entering into the process and sending the people that way because it says here the Lord added to their number every day. And when they're coming to the early church, the early church isn't saying, no, 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 we got enough. We're good. We're, we're happy. You look different. You sound different. You're not quite, we don't really know you that well. We don't trust you. They weren't saying that. They were saying, come on in. Otherwise, the church would not have grown by leaps and bounds as it did. And I get concerned a little bit that our church is declining. You know, the church overall in the world today, is, at least in the United States, is declining today. And maybe this is part of the reason. You know that movie, don't you, The Field of Dreams, where it says, build it and they will come? You know that? Well, I really worked hard on this creative, this creative little change to it. But fellowship and love and they will come. Isn't that, that was really creative of me, wasn't it? I changed one. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That was really. But fellowship and love, and they will come. What I mean by that is if we fellowship with each other, and I know I'm, I'm not discouraging that. I'm encouraging it to fellowship with each other and to, and to show love for each other and open up our lives to each other. But when other people outside of our group see that and want in, we can't be so distrustful. We have to allow them in. And again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying bring in people that are going to hurt us. Because if they do, we can push them out. It is perfectly permissible to do that. But I am saying, how do we expect disciples to be made for Christ if we don't allow people into our midst, into us to allow them to learn about Christ and to be part of the fellowship like we are? That's point number one. Point number two, I'm going to tell you, is a little bit harder uh, overall. And it goes back to the very first verse. 
that we read today. And I think this is the most important verse of the Scripture that we read. This is Acts 2, verse 42. And it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And the word I'm going to point out to you here that is, I believe, so important is that word devoted. They devoted themselves. If you devote yourself to something, are you only putting your toe in the water and kind of just dipping it in and being very careful with it? I don't think so. Are you only going in like 50% or even 70 for 75%? Is that all the further you're going in? I don't think so. When we say you're devoting yourself to something, you're all in, aren't you? You, body and soul, I've put it all in. I'm going all in with this. I'm devoting myself to this. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do other things. It doesn't mean that you don't have, this is the only thing you do in your life. But that's where your heart is. That's where your soul is. You've devoted yourself to this. And God is saying, this is the church, God is saying, that he blessed the first church, the early church, the birth of the church. And what did he bless when they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. Now, what is the apostles' teaching? Because at the time, at the time, this was just after, again, the resurrection of of Christ and then uh, him returning to heaven. At the time, there was no Scripture. Well, there was Scripture. It was all Old Testament. There was no New Testament Scripture, I should say. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. There was, we didn't have that. The church did not have that. And so they had to rely, instead of Scripture, they had to rely on the apostles' teaching. But I have no doubt that really it's the same thing. What were the apostles teaching about? I'm sure they were teaching about the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What our Scriptures tell us about today. We have a lot of that apostles' teaching included in our New Testament Scripture today. So I, it's easier for me to just say, what were they devoted to? They devoted themselves to Scripture, to learning it, to living it, to understanding it. The next thing they devoted themselves to was fellowship. And again, I believe, based on the Scripture, that we're talking about an open fellowship, a fellowship that said not only do we care for each other, but we want people to come in and join us. We want them to be part of our fellowship. Next, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And you might say, what does that have to do with anything? And, and, and most of us would say, I would gladly devote myself to eating if that's what this is about. And it is to some degree, but not to that extent. It's about the breaking of bread together. It's part of fellowship because I say this in, in the most uh, uh, positive way possible. Eating together is an intimate act. And again, I mean that in the most positive, uplifting way possible. It is an intimate act, meaning that we open up our lives to each other. We're sitting at a table, we're eating, and we're we're talking while we eat. It is a complete act of fellowship because of that, opening up our lives to each other around that table. And it also, I believe, means joining in communion with each other when we celebrate communion. And finally, what? They devoted themselves to prayer, to praying as a group, to being together, to developing their relationship with God. And and now, don't take this to mean that they weren't devoted also to, you know, the basis of all this is their fellowship in Christ, of being devoted to Christ, of helping others. We saw about that. But this is what God is saying. Here is my blueprint for the early church. This is what I want you now as a church to do, to devote yourselves to to, uh, uh, Scripture, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. I want you to devote yourself to that. And I have to tell you, I have to tell you, this is a problem that I have with the church right now. I have a problem with it. Let me explain. Let me explain how I got to the problem first, and I'll tell you what the problem is. I got to the problem because, honestly, 
this week, I, I was given this scripture. I, I didn't pick this scripture, and I don't mean that in a bad way. This happened, you know, we plan out worship services, and this is the scripture that just fell this week. And so, it, it, you know, Pastor Smith is on vacation, so this is the scripture that fell this week. So I was given this scripture. But it caused me to really think, and then the events of last Sunday, I believe it was, happened with Las Vegas. Was that Sunday? I have to admit that the days run together. And those events happened, and, and it really saddened my heart, and it brought to the forefront a problem that I have. When I look at this scripture, when I look at the world, and when I look at everything that's going on, I have a problem. Because I've lived, I'm 54 years old. I'm 54 years old. I've lived, this makes me even sound older, but it's an easier way of saying it. It's a, another way of saying it. I've lived now in six different decades. In six different decades, and that's a lot. And I, I'm sorry, my mother probably makes her think that that makes her sound older than, than she thought before. <laughs> And I apologize, but I've lived in six different decades and I don't remember a time, I don't remember a time when we have been this divided, where there has been this much anger, when there has been this much hatred, when there has been this much bitterness. I don't remember it. Maybe there was, but I truly don't recall it. And it seems to just be about everything now. There's this anger and bitterness and nastiness and name-calling. And maybe it's helped in a, long, a lot of ways by Twitter and by Facebook, and we have these social media outlets that we can just automatically do things and, and throw our own opinions out there. Everybody has a platform now. Maybe that causes part of it. But I just don't remember this much anger and bitterness in our, our society. And here's my problem. Here is my heartfelt problem. Why hasn't the church separated itself from the rest of society when it comes to this problem right now today? Why don't we see a difference between society in general and those of us in the church? Maybe it's there, but I don't see it. We as a church are supposed to be devoted to what? To Scripture, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Are we seeing that in the world right now? Are we as a church showing that that's what we're devoted to? Or are we joining in with the bitterness and anger? Because if we're devoted to these things, do we have time even to join in with that nastiness that's going on? And I have to tell you, it, 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 it troubles my heart. It really does. And I can hear some people already, I can, I, I can read your minds. I'm telling you right now, I know there's some people out there right now who are saying, wait a minute, quit picking on me. You're on a different side of the political spectrum I am. I know that there's people out there thinking that right now, but I'm standing here and I'm telling you completely honestly with all my heart, I'm saying I don't care if you're on the far right. I don't care if you're on the far left. I don't care if you're anywhere in between. It's coming from everywhere, folks. Because none of us are stopping it. We're all getting dragged into it. And we're all participating in it, at least in some fashion, either by doing it or by not stopping it. What are we teaching our kids? What are we showing the world? How are we showing these people that we are fellowshipping with each other and that we are disciples of Christ? How are we showing that we are devoted to Scripture, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer? How are we showing that? And I hear some of you now, I hear, I hear it in your minds again. I, I'm a great mind reader today, and I can hear it in some of your minds. I can hear you saying, yeah, but I understand that, but it's so much worse now than it has been before. You tell us that you're 54 years old, but in 54 years old, tell me when it's been this bad. And I would say to you, you probably are right. But I point back to the first church. 
And I say they were being persecuted by their own church, by the church leaders. They were being persecuted by them. They were being persecuted by their government. Their very lives were at risk. But yet, what do we hear? But yet, they were devoted to Scripture, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that they went and hid behind a wall somewhere. I don't think that they went and separated themselves from society in a physical way, but they separated themselves by the way they lived their lives and their actions and the way they acted toward each other. And I think we need to get back to that, don't we? Don't we need to do the same thing? Because, folks, I may be crazy, Well, I know I am. I know, please, that was a big opening. That was a big opening there. I know I'm crazy in many ways, but what I'm talking about is I may be crazy, but doesn't the bitterness and anger and name-calling, doesn't it have to end somewhere? And why can't it be us? Why shouldn't it be us? Shouldn't it be the church that is the agent to stop this? Shouldn't it be us standing up and saying, wait, I'm not going to get dragged into this. And I don't get me wrong. I know how easy it is. I've been dragged into it. I know I have. I've been dragged into the anger and the nastiness and the bitterness. But isn't it up to us to stand up and say, no more. I'm not going to do that. I want to devote myself to Scripture and fellowship and breaking bread and prayer. That's what I want to devote myself to because that's what God wants me to devote myself to. And yes, this stuff is going on around me, but I'm going to choose not to be a part of it. And maybe, just maybe, if we start doing that, maybe, just maybe, the people outside of the church will start seeing that. And maybe, just maybe, that that more people will say, I want to do the same thing. I don't want to get dragged into this. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to teach my kids that this is okay. I don't want to teach the next generation that it's perfectly permissible to be so angry and bitter and nasty. I want to teach them that they should be devoted to Scripture and fellowship and breaking bread and prayer. That's what I want to teach them. So maybe if we get back to following the blueprint that God has laid out for us in Scripture, maybe if we get back to the first church and the way this church was born and how this church grew, maybe, just maybe, and I know it's a challenge and I know it's difficult and I know it's hard, but we also know, don't we, we also know that to those who are given much, much is expected and we have been given so much eternal life and love and grace and peace and forgiveness. We've been given so much and so much is expected, so I know it's hard, but maybe if we get back to that, the Scripture that I read will start applying to us. And maybe we can say, and the Lord added to their number at Gravel Hill daily those who are being saved. Amen.